All right. Hello and welcome to the Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Russell Thackeray, who is in the south coast, on the south coast of England. How are you doing, Dr. Russell? Um, John, Dr. John, even. I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> it's, a, it's a horrible, wet, miserable day in England. And I'm looking at your happy, smiley face in San Diego, and I'm not the slightest bit jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we get zero sympathy. If I if I even mention that maybe we're having a bad day in San Diego, I get zero sympathy from the rest of the world because we do really have an all year round summer. And I really do hate to tell you, but there's a heat wave coming this weekend. But <laughs> <laughs> so we um, have better resilience in the in the UK, you see. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But as a, as a, as a former, as grown, been born, bred, and buttered in Ireland, like I I I appreciate this weather greatly, having experienced yeah. the other for many many years. Okay, so uh, uh, you are the driving force and principal consultant uh, for QED, and you help uh, you know deliver pragmatic and robust development training through speaking, training, and coaching. And today, what we are going to talk to us about is sales resilience. And let's face it, uh, if you don't have resilience, you probably shouldn't be in sales, right? Um, yeah, it's as simple as that. And I actually think sometimes we overburden salespeople with expectations of high intelligence and high empathy. And actually, they're sometimes the wrong things to be focused on, because actually the ability to grit your teeth, get over yourself and get on with it is really, really important. The, the ability to sort of um, to realize that if you're making telesales calls and you've got 35 to do in the day, 34 of those might be rejections. And actually, you know, the quicker you fail, the quicker you move on to the next call, the quicker you can, you know, sort of reassert yourself and grab yourself and then focus your attention on the next call, the, the more likely you are to be successful. And I think we've, I think sometimes um, we've sort of lost that sort of, um, that grit in the sales process because we've got so focused on the sort of um, um, fluffy side of sales. And, and we have to be careful, of course, because there are different types of sales. There are telesales teams, there are people who are, you know, working in SMBs who are, you know, basically just doing trade shows. And there are people who are doing huge pitches for many, many millions of pounds because they're huge IT pitches. But the thing is, it's all sales. And actually, although it's the most natural set of skills, it's the problem with resilience is this idea of facing your fears and getting over rejection mm -hmm. and learning from it because of course there's no point just you know getting over um doing it wrong and then bouncing back and then doing it wrong again that's a bit like um some sports people isn't it you know when you're um there used to, there used to be a, a professional footballer who was called sick note he used to play for tottenham hotspur which i yeah that's is, right yeah. you know you know Janus, and um, he was a very poor player, but he, and he was always off ill, and every time he'd come back, he was ready to play again. You'd almost be looking, thinking, oh, go and be ill again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I do tell you, I mean, I love, um, I love combat sports and, uh, you know, mixed martial arts and stuff, and sometimes, uh, you know, when things aren't going the way of a particular fighter, I mean, the thing is, they're just told is bite down on your mouth guard and walk forward, you know, and I think that's a great... Uh, analogy sometimes for sales because I think sometimes as you say I think what differentiates the, the successful from the not so successful are the ones who are able to bite, bite down on their mouth guard and march forward even when things are not going their way and I think and I think it's easy to oversimplify this because oh so now it's actually easy to overgeneralize this because it does depend mm -hmm. on um, which end of the scale you're at. So if you're doing a volume telesales job, and many, many years ago, I used to have to do 50 sales mm -hmm. calls a day, and it was simply a question of churning the numbers, you know, and, and sometimes you actually quite like the rejections because they were, they were quicker. I know that's yeah. bizarre, but when the measurers do 50 and none of the measures not do it well, then, you know, that's one of the sort of anomalies of sales planning and sales pipelines. But the, 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 the more important thing comes when you're doing a small number of calls. So let's say you have a pitch and there's one pitch per week and you've got to get the whole thing ready. You can become so overly perfectionistic and so overthinking about the thing and actually you become so frightened and locked up. You can't just be yourself in that process as well. So some of this is about just being 
recognizing that sales is one of the most natural set of skills and, and just doing it, but that the, the, the resilience you use in the telesales job is a different form of resilience you use in the high value sales job. And, and it's, it's really important to understand that because if you apply the wrong resilience, you get burnout. Yeah. So we have yeah. to be careful to make sure we're managing people in the right way based on the sort of transaction of what's going on. No, no, that's a, that's a great point because, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, sometimes the resilience is, as you say, if you are selling big ticket items and maybe you only sell three or four a year, maybe that's the, you know, because the deal sizes are so big, the resilience, as you say, is is sticking through the whole sales cycle, but being prepared and doing all your work and making sure all the all the pieces are in place. But as you say, uh, you can fall into the trap of of overthinking things as well, right? And and then maybe putting too much power in the hands of the buyer. Yeah, and I think it comes down to the different sort of pressure that's experienced. And there's a different pressure that comes from having one, one sales pitch a week to 50 sales pitches a day on the telesales mm -hmm. side. And given that whole pressure is inside your own head, actually being able to understand that different form of pressure and how you look at that. And also understanding that when you get things wrong, there's an accountability piece that says, I got it wrong. What do I learn from that? Because actually, if you don't get a sale, it's not because the buyer is wrong. It's because you didn't find the right mechanism to get the sale that you needed. And I think a lot of times when we're thinking about, um, you know, the accountability sales piece, you know, you go and do a, de you go and do a pitch and then they'd come away saying there was nothing else I could have done. Well, there's always something else you could have done if you didn't win that deal because you didn't find the killer touch. You didn't find the killer phrase. You didn't find the killer piece of the relationship jigsaw. And so the pressure that comes from that one-off sale or once a week sale or once a quarter sale. I mean, I used to work with an IT guy whose, um, whose target was, was achieved in one meeting per year. And, oh, you know, the, yeah. the pressure he used to have to put himself under to do that gig was quite extraordinary. But he always did it because, of course, he used to spend nine months of the year pre-lobbying that deal to make sure he got it. And I think a lot of the times when we're selling, we don't realize there's that, you know, plowing the field first. So when you walk into the pitch it's not the first time you're sort of facing the issue it's not the first time yeah. you're facing the light to people's eyes especially big ticket and i think people forget the whole persuasion um thing around how you sort of set um, the sales process up and the sales process going and i think a lot of the time you know when we're thinking about our own sales process the same happens in reverse you know often it we're extremely difficult to buy from you know, we have a sales force that makes it really hard to buy from us because we like yeah. to do it in a certain sort of way. Whereas the customer would much prefer to do it in each way. I mean, you know, here's a, here's a classic. I went to buy a car recently. And I mean, I had to fight my way through the sales process. Oh, oh, just, yeah, yeah. Can I just buy it? No, no, we have to take you for a test drive. I yeah. don't want a test drive. No, but you have to have one because that's part of our CSI thing. Yeah. And then it's like, have you ever bought a car yourselves? No, I, we have yeah. company cars. I said, well, you know, maybe you should try it from time to time. And I think sometimes yeah, when we're looking, at and, I, and I think that's a, I, I think that's a great point that you made there because it's the same, it's it's the same over here. It's like nowadays, when I go to buy a car or lease a new car or whatever, uh, I start off doing the communication through email, and yeah. uh, and it drives them crazy. And they say, come in for it, you know, oh, you want to come in and we can talk about it. And I say, no, no. I'm not coming in until you answer all of these questions. Yeah. And then I'll come in, I'll come in to sign the paperwork. <laughs> and you see, so now you've hit the nail on the head because of course the sales team have been measured by the number of test drives they conduct. And they're right. measured because test drives linked to CSI customer satisfaction. And so what you end right. up getting is this peculiar situation where salespeople are working to tick a box rather than to do what's right. Because mm. And the trouble is with process, the reason we have process is to make it process, you know, make it scalable and make it consistent mm -hmm. because in the Wild West days, 20 years ago, of course, we as salespeople, certainly, you know, we were just making up as we went along and we had a lovely time and we did all sorts of heinous crimes. And now we have a level of compliance and regulation on us, which isn't there. But now we've forgotten the selling piece, which is, you know, sometimes when you're selling in the retail world, just sell a thing. Make yeah, it easy yeah. to buy because that's the simplest thing of sales. Allow the customer to buy it instead of you trying to sell it. Yeah, and and uh, and I think the, it, it's a really important point for people to take on board because I did. I mean, I took over a company one time um, that I was running, and what I did was initially 
you know, because I was a new CEO, I went out and I said, oh, line me up a bunch of customers and I'll go see them and just, um, you know, ask them about their experience with us and everything. And I went out and I was shocked because they were very loyal customers and they said, oh, love, love your products, love your services, everything you do, but boy, you're hard to do business with. Yeah. And I was like, what? And yeah, it turned out that, yeah, exactly what you're talking about. We were making it hard to do business with our customers. So I think that's a key point is always looking at things through your buyer's eyes. And it's very easy to do because all you got to do is ask them. Well, the thing is, you see, you get some areas of sales like financial services or legal mm -hmm. services, and you have uh, the big compliance agencies and such like. And sure. I was talking to um, a financial advisor recently. He was just sat trying to sell savings and pensions. And we had to do 50, go through a process that involved 57 signatures. And it was yeah, a yeah, test yeah. of customer res resilience. <laughs> and all, all he could do, all he could do was apologize all the way through it because he didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, but the government de demanded it. Yeah. And actually the credit to him was he built such a strong relationship during the process that actually by the end of it, I, I was I was desperately trying to say, is there a way I can help you help you do your job easier? Because I feel yeah. so sorry for you. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, I think that's, that's the sign of a good salesperson. They managed to yes. they managed to turn um, adversity into a joint process. Well, yes. Yeah, so the, what they did was, uh, in in essence, they moved you from the other side of the table to the same side of the table, which is uh, is where you want to be at the end of the day. So you're collaborating. Uh, but one other point, just to go back to, I think on resilience, and I think this is a really important point that you touched on earlier, is particularly if you have long sales cycles, et cetera, is it, it's very, very easy to develop bad habits, to stop doing the very fundamental, you know, maybe the boring things that you used to do in order to make sure that that sales cycle went as smoothly as possible. And I think part of resilience is actually making sure that you are paying attention to the details. Even if you've been doing this for 30 years, it's sometimes it's good to go back and just say, yeah, am, I, am I still doing everything I should be doing? Well, you, uh, it's interesting you'd say that as an ex-CEO, <laughs> because as an ex-sales director, I might disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and well, actually, I think, I think we're sort of violently agreeing in a funny sort of way. The first thing is I, I think you have to go back and look at um, the differences between then and now. Mm -hmm. Right. Because actually, I think the world has moved on. The way we sell is different. You're right in terms of, you know, is there anything I'm forgetting? Is there anything I should be doing better? But the fundamental thing for me is to say, in this wired world, you know, we can't run a sales process the way we've done it before because we're using oh, technology. Oh, sure, sure. You know, we're doing all that sort of stuff. And But I think you get two types of salespeople, really. You get the sort of artists you know, the mm -hmm. improvisers, the sort of um, the flamboyant show-offs and um, who can extemporize pitch on, you know, turn on the sixpence. And you get the sort of more doer, play it by the book, you know, the people who've learned spin and those sorts of, yes. you know, sales processes. And and for and for those people, I think you're absolutely right. They need to go back and look at it because they, they're they not paid to be clever. They're paid to be relentless. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to understand the differences in the sales processes and the degree of, again, resilience between those two sets of people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, and incidentally, it's actually Spin was the company, Hathaway was the company I used to be CEO of. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really are violently agreeing now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, yeah, but but I absolutely, absolutely agree with you. I think it's always a balancing act of where you have to um, look at how things have changed. I think you have to look at what has changed and what has stayed yeah. the same. And so you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater or whatever. Um, and I think that is part of uh, because the other thing I think uh, I think Russell the other the other um, temptation we have today is with all this technology with things like inbound marketing and all of that. It's become there's a message out there that everything is easy and you should just sit back as a salesperson and wait for things to drop into your lap. And of course, everybody intellectually knows that that's not the truth, yeah. but it's a very, very, uh, it's a very, very hypnotizing message, isn't it? Well, it is. And it, and it goes along another side, another less, a message, which is that it's okay to be doer and boring. And I think, the, the opportunity of using technology is to make is to differentiate yourself as a salesperson, is to not see it as an adversarial process. 
Mm-hmm. It, and I think sometimes the salesperson, a bit like the, my financial person, you, you're more of a facilitator these days because actually, a bit like your car thing, you know what you know. Mo- you're mostly in a perfect market now where everybody knows everything. So the, the salesperson's the differentiator. They're the, they're the sort of the pixie dust, the magic piece. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I don't think we think that. Uh, so it's not about waiting for it to come along. It's about understanding that instead of forcing a sale to happen, it's it's allowing a purchase to happen. So we're yeah. flicking it around and we're constantly thinking as salespeople, how do I make this easier to buy, your point earlier, rather than how do I push it harder to sell? Because the more you're pushing a sale to happen, the more resilience you need. And actually the, the clever, the smartest people in the world know that managing a process is all about steering and guiding, facilitating and enabling and not driving and ramming and forcing. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, talking to the, to the people who even who are doing telesales today, 50 calls a day, you, no one's got the energy to be, to be bothered with that so much today. So because actually we've got a different world that we're living in. And why not use technology to, you know, to, to plow the furrow? But then when we're salespeople, then we can do it differently. And I think things like spin um, are great because they're fundamental. How we do spin? Mm-hmm. Should I say seven point zero? Because I'm sure two point zero and three point zero have already <laughs> been and gone. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. All right, well, listen, we're bumping up against the end of our time here, um, Russell. But before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, your company, and what you do. Yeah, it's lovely. Well, we specialize in helping people with resilience, both in terms of sales resilience, sales leadership and resilience, and personal resilience as well. We've got a bunch of online courses and resources, which all can be found at qedod.com. Or you can link into me on LinkedIn at Russell Packeray, because that's my name. And um, (laughs) you're more than welcome to drop an email if anybody wants to know anything or find out anything more at info or russell at qedod.com. Excellent. Well, Dr. Russell Thackeray, I'll leave you to enjoy your beautiful evening oh, <laughs> there in, uh, indoors. Hey. <laughs> your beautiful evening indoors. With the fireworks. <laughs> up the heating. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all from the expert interview really soon. Thank you.